the Hades Persephone story. You know, when I was younger, I was just kind of swept up in the idea of it and, you know, and I loved it and I still love it. But at the, also at the same time, I, you know, there's so many different avenues you can take with it. And it's, you know, yes, to me, there is a little bit of Stockholm syndrome there. If you are truly believing in the side of the myth where he, you know, plots to kidnap her essentially and take her down to the underworld and eventually she'll love me. Um, you know, there's that side of it. Then there's some that say that, you know, she, you know, yeah, she went down there and she had the choice of, of staying or not. And then, but then she ate the fruit, even though he warned her and then she's mm -hmm. stuck there. Um, so there's so many different avenues, but I guess I've never been a huge fan of the Stockholm syndrome one. Welcome to Speculative Sandbox, your audio playground for creative storytellers. My name is Vicki Lawn, and each episode, I and a guest will unpack a fiction trope with an eye for character development and narrative structures. Make sure to look for Speculative Sandbox on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where you can join the conversation. Leave comments or questions, or let us know what other tropes we should cover. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. Greek mythology set the standard for many story tropes and character archetypes seen in today's fiction. From tragedies to triumphant battles, petty arguments to unrequited love, the Greek gods continue to leave a lasting impression because they're undeniably relatable. USA Today best-selling romance author Carly Spade joins me in talking about the allure of the Greek gods. We discuss some of their shadier pasts, as well as Carly's approach for retelling their stories to a modern audience. Tell me about yourself, your work, your, your latest novels. Tell me all about it. Sure. So I'm Carly Spade. Um, I am an indie author. Um, I live in Colorado with my husband and my two fur dog babies. And as far as my work work goes, so I actually do have a day job currently. I hope to become a full-time writer soon, but for right now, <laughs> to pay the, the bills, so to speak, I'm actually a program mentor for a university helping cybersecurity hopefuls get through their cybersecurity degrees, as that is what my master's is in ironically it is not writing oh, very cool same I, i'm similar to i have a day job that's completely unrelated to my writing <laughs> Right. Yeah. And actually, and I, I'm, I'm a okay with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Cause if I were writing for my day job, plus also trying to write a uh, fantasy world, I think it would just be a little overwhelming to be honest with you. A so. lot of computer. Yeah. Well, I guess you do have computer time, but it's in a different way. It's numbers I'm guessing. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah, exactly. And actually most of my job spent there is talking to people on the phone. So it's completely, um, and it, it actually is nice because it's a remote job and it, and in between calls and downtime, I have the opportunity to be writing during the day, which I know a lot of um, people that have day jobs too and write don't have that advantage. So I feel very thankful for that. Um, so, but yeah, that's what I do for a day job. And yes, like I said, I have, I do have a master's in cyber. I do try to write as often as I can. Some of the stuff that I've actually earned those degrees in into my writing. Um, I do find ways here and there. Um, and as far as, uh, new releases and upcoming things, my contemporary mythos series, um, is getting ready to wrap up for the main series anyway. Um, can't say too much else than that, but, um, just know that the characters, uh, we will be visiting them again. Um, even though Zeus will be the last book of the main releasing uh, April 25th. Uh, Poseidon just came out March 25th, actually came out a little earlier than expected, um, but it did come out at the end of March. Um, and yeah, so those two, that one just came out and Zeus will be wrapping up the main series of book six for the contemporary mythos series. So That's so exciting that you're writing about Greek mythology. I love Greek mythology. And when you and I connected briefly um, over email, we discovered we have a shared love for Xena and Hercules. So yes. <laughs> tell me how you first got into Greek mythology and what did you love about Xena and Hercules? So I think most of us, um, especially I'm, I'm, I'm an 80s, born in the 80s, raised in the 90s, baby. But I feel that a lot of people from that era, from that um born of that deck, those decades, uh, definitely had Greek mythology starting at maybe a middle school. 
um, they really, really go into it pretty deep. And for me, it was constant. And then I would, it got to dabble in other mythologies, but Greek was definitely something that has been in my schooling since, yeah, since I was in middle school. That's where I first got introduced to it. However, when I really got into it, it really was with Xena and Hercules, the TV shows. I was absolutely obsessed. Meaning, I mean, my entire room was Xena Warrior Princess for I don't even know how long. I went to conventions. My parents were awesome and took me. I got to meet Meet some of the actors and I was just absolutely in love with those shows and I loved that they they did this style of you know okay the Greek gods and everything actually do exist they communicate with the characters the main characters they're they're interwoven they did retellings they kind of put their own spin on some of the myths and it made me want to go out there and actually you know research you know what did they actually take from the actual myth and then what did they take license with so i you know it kind of helped me learn along the way and they're just so fun the shows were absolutely fun they were funny slapstick humor and i just i i absolutely loved it and it was a huge inspiration for me throughout my entire childhood and obviously into adulthood i've pulled even from those shows even from my current uh writings so <laughs> yeah, it's so fun now because i i recognize i've been reading other books too where i recognize little tiny little hints that go they watch Xena growing up whether it's you know symbolism in their stories or cultural like where you shake hands but you're shaking each other's wrists or forearms you yep. know yes uh, <laughs> I was like oh that's a tell um I'm so jealous because I also decorated my bedroom I did not have parents that took me to conventions I would have killed to meet I remember when I was like oh, I don't know in middle school I was like my biggest dream is to meet Lucy Lawless oh, and yeah. yet to happen uh in in my case so I I had the same exact situation, middle school curriculum, you have the Greek gods. And I felt mm -hmm. like I had um, an advanced knowledge because I was already watching Xena and Hercules, yeah. despite how they may have warped the stories, but it was still delightful. Uh, mm -hmm. But I remember when I was seven, they, I, my parents got me this second, uh, things your second grader needs to know book. And they had the Greek gods in there. Looking back, I'm like, wow, that's pretty advanced. But I... I just like became obsessed from that point on because I remember thinking, you know, oh, you know, superheroes are for kids. I, my parents don't pay attention to that stuff. But here I am reading about belief systems that were uh, wholly believed by full societies, you know, back in the yeah. day. And so for me, that was just so great. And then it turned into, um, you know, Disney's Hercules that came out. Mm -hmm. Then there are Percy Jackson books and, you know, so on and so forth. Yes, Disney's Hercules was also a big one for me too. I mean, I that actually started my initial. Uh, I've, I've, as I watched it several times, I as a, even as a kid, I said, you know, Hades isn't really. I mean, I think people are giving him a bad rep. This isn't kind of this isn't fair because mm -hmm. <laughs> because Zeus is kind of just as big of a meanie, honestly, to me as Hades is. He's kind oh, of yeah. being being very mean to his brother. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. And so. I, I, I'm a little shady because I, I took a Greek myth class in college and I'm a little shaky on it. But I, I just remember Zeus and Hades really being, you know, you really can't say one is better than the other. They're, they're matters of circumstance and privilege. Oh, it yeah. seems like Poseidon is the one brother that's kind of just doing his thing. Um, maybe I'm maybe I'm kind of shady on my memory, though. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I obviously, I, I did a lot of research recently. I, I had to, you know, I, I came into this series with, you know, general good knowledge of Greek myths, but I have learned so much even in these past couple of years from doing this series that of things that I either had either forgotten or didn't realize or didn't really dig too deep into. And the dynamic between the three brothers is actually something I go into really heavy in Zeus. And uh, it is actually very interesting to see how each of them actually actually do lend into the just keeping Olympus afloat. It's not just one or the other. It's all three of them truly lend something. The only thing I'll say about Poseidon, and I had to be careful with my book too, is he, you know, like Zeus has a bit of a reputation for certain things mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, specifically also Medusa. And I really wanted to make sure that I, you know, I don't, I, I wanted my world to be, you know, not necessarily a utopia, but I wanted it to not be maybe as tragic because the whole point of my series is to make people laugh and, and swoon and maybe cry tears of joy. So obviously Greek mythology has a lot of tragedy. Yes. And uh, that was something that I just chose as an author to take creative license on and try to, even if there was some stuff that I actually said, yes, that did happen, 
they are redeeming themselves. And Poseidon, definitely, that's a case there. Um, the, so I, I've always viewed Hades as the most level-headed, to be honest with you. And I think that's the reason why Zeus gave him the underworld, because he knew that himself and Poseidon would have never been able to hack it and the underworld would have crumbled uh -huh. because they just... <laughs> That's always been kind of my take is that uh, Hades was the only one mentally, I feel, prepared to be able to do that. And it still it still makes him, you know, this kind of emo guy because it's kind of depressing being in darkness all the time. And <laughs> yes, emo uh, and alluring yeah. and mysterious and all yes. these wonderful traits that we could think about. <laughs> yes, yes. But I really, truly think that. Um, and I, again, I go really heavy into it in the Zeus book, um, even that I think that, that was one thing that Zeus actually they're trying to make it seem like he did uh, Hades, you know, uh, I'm banishing you to the underworld. And I don't necessarily see it as that. I see it as, yes, I know you got a bad deal with having to be down here. However, you were the only one that could have done it. You were the only one because you have the head for it. And it's, a, it's almost kind of a compliment in a way to me. So, in Interesting. I love that take. Okay, so then of all the Greek gods, they made, we can look at the major 12 or any of the minor gods. Who is your favorite and why? So when I was a kid and learning mythology, as we just talked about, and Xena and Hercules and all that, I would have said Apollo and Aphrodite without even thinking about it. Um, and especially also Aphrodite because of Xena and Hercules, I absolutely loved the version mm -hmm. of her mm -hmm. on those shows. However, as an adult, now the past two years, I actually would say now Ares and Zeus. <laughs> okay. And now Ares, obviously I liked Ares on the shows because it was Kevin Smith and he was amazing on those shows. Yeah. But just the character himself, I, you know, you, you read, especially Homer, man, did he really, he gave Ares a what for. Um, <laughs> I, and I, I did so much research and it was actually the same type of things that I was seeing repeated with both Ares and Zeus. And it really was who is telling the story about them because you can tell if they were a fan or they were not. Um, and I think that Homer, uh, being an Athenian, um, kind of, you know, lent towards Athena, put her in mm -hmm. this, you know, ethereal light. And he always did everything he could to put Ares in a more negative light. Um, whereas the, um, the Spartans, they didn't, they didn't do that. They put him actually in a, in a better light. And I read, you know, their versions of the stories and the myths of Ares. And he's actually this really awesome alpha hero, macho guy who's actually a bit of a sweetheart and likes to dance. <laughs> so interesting. Okay. So um, Ares is the God of war and Athena is the God of wisdom and military strategy. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Would they, you, would you say that the same side, different sides to the same coin? Yes. And that's the, it was interesting because it, basically from my research and what I gathered is that Ares is basically more Sparta God of war, mm -hmm. if you want it in a better light. And then Athena represents Athens. So there was obviously always an actual contention between Sparta and Athens. And so they, those gods represented each of them. And I think that that's why with Homer being of, of Athens, he put Ares in that, you know, he had the power of the quill and put him in that bad light. Um, so, but that, and that is why I actually learned to like him a lot because, you know, I, I also never really, I know a lot of people love the story of Ares and Aphrodite, but obviously for my series, I, I really didn't want to include incest. I know it was a big part of the Greek myths, but for trying to do modern retellings and making them into romantic sure, comedies, yeah. mm -hmm. not exactly the best thing. So can you um, summarize what that original Ares and Aphrodite mythology was? Yeah, so the, it's basically supposed to be love and war, and I completely get it, and I love the the initial you know intent behind it, and obviously they are brother and sister, and she is married to Hephaestus, and she cheats on him with Ares because it's this clandestine love between the two of them. Again, love and war, the balance, and all that, and I I like the idea behind it. I love it, of course, but um, for me, for you know trying to do what I was trying to do, I also have always loved the story of. Aphrodite and Hephaestus and the the mm -hmm. the potential behind that too inner versus outer beauty and the blessings and cursings of both of them when you're really wrapped up in one or the other um so I feel that that story actually they kind of missed a lot they could have done with that too um and they really concentrated on this whole thing between brother and sister yeah um because <laughs> Hephaestus is the one he's like a bit homely he's making tools correct 
Yeah, he's the god of the forge, mm -hmm. um, and he is said to have this huge gnarly scar down one side of his face, which he was and he was so ugly that Hera threw him off of Olympus. <laughs> yeah, it was so sad, you know, that Hera uh, and she in certain myths she just she didn't have any guy that m made her pregnant with him, which is what I went with, so that him and Aphrodite aren't aren't related either. <laughs> Um, so I went with that version of the story where Hera created him to get back at Zeus. Um, and he, she's like, I'm going to make my own kid. And unfortunately, when he was born, he to her, he was ugly as sin. So she tossed him off a bit. So that really. <laughs> um, uh, so I really have always liked that aspect of between Aphrodite and Hephaestus. Um, so that's why I kind of went with that route with my story. And then Zeus, too, has become a really quick favorite because I was really, really hellbent on. Uh, debunking, you know, everybody's absolute hatred for him. I, I, I told myself if Ares has these other elements that I've been able to find, there has to be stuff with Zeus. And I found so many things, you know, and even just the William Shakespeare quote of heavy is the head that wears the crown. That is a huge theme in my entire uh, story is because I don't think that people give him enough credit and you you can't just say that all of those t stories of him cheating on his wife countless times and sleeping with all these women and turning himself into animals and gold mist and mm -hmm. all these crazy stories. Um, you really think that, you know, uh, there, I mean, let's even just say it's real. Let's say mythology was real. How much of that do you actually think would be real? You yeah. know, so. Well, it sounds to me like if you're ever in a situation where you were in a relationship with somebody and you're thinking, you know, this guy's going to be in my life. And then maybe he pieces out for whatever reason. And now you're in trouble with the parents. You're like, uh, Zeus, Zeus did it. And I'm yes, not responsible. <laughs> yes. A hundred percent. Yes. That's exactly what the, a big part of even the, uh, historical accounts that I was reading of people kind of going into what their theories were. That was a huge one. They used Zeus to make sense and give reason for their taboos and their, you know, what, what they want to do. They, they want to be able to, well, Zeus cheated on his wife and there's no problem with me doing it it's king of the gods mm -hmm. so that's a huge uh theme that i went with as well that and he just kind of allowed it because you know he is of the people and he is as much of a king of the gods as he is a king of humanity and you know if that if they need you know to do that to be able to make sense of their lives and to be comfortable and to you know basically use them as their sounding board then so be it that he'll he'll deal with it so um, because of that, and, and he's such a powerful character and he did, you know, everybody forgets that he did save his brothers and do all this stuff. Um, so I think people just get really wrapped up in the cheating factor. And there's so much more to him that I really have grown, grown very fond of that God for Interesting. sure. Okay. Yeah. So then why do you think we've talked about what we love about uh, Greek mythology, your favorite character? Well, actually, I just realized I haven't shared my favorite character yet. Yes, um, please. Okay. <laughs> my favorite character, I think from being very young, I actually really loved Artemis just because mm. there's this liberated woman, you know, aspect to her where she's out in the forest doing her thing. Free spirit, dangerous and a little mm. scary. Don't don't mess with her. And I always I always like that aspect of her. Um, I didn't really dive too much further into it. I just, you know, I, I enjoyed that freedom, that sense of freedom that's associated with her. Okay, so why do you think Greek mythology resonates so strongly with our modern audience? So I truly think that Greek mythology, and this is for any mythology, honestly, but with Greek specifically, I'll get into why I think that that's more popular. But Greek mythology was, is kind of shows us, and I think you hinted on this earlier, um, you know, shadows of this ancient culture and how they saw the world. That's all in the myths and the way that the gods are, their interaction with the gods, the temples, the fact of how many temples they erected and all these gods honor. And it's, it's a very, it's, it's kind of our viewpoint into what life was like in Greece or even Rome, if you want to go, because they have their own version of their mythology. But I think that it, it's become so popular because Greek mythology has had found a way to, you know, even from the beginning become widespread. Um, um, and again, Romans, they created their own version of the gods, too, of the same mythology, but they named them differently and maybe put their own little spin on things that satisfied their culture, which was mm -hmm. different, you know, from Greece. But, you know, it became so widespread. Other mythologies, Norse, Aztec, Celtic, Egyptian, they were all more localized. And so they didn't even really have the chance to get more popular because they weren't widespread like Greek was. And Greece itself has had so much, even historically, and Rome has had so much, you know, uh, influence on 
culture and society and things that we still use to this day. So I think that we it just makes sense that we would pull their mythology in with it too, because obviously if they gave us all this, you know, architecture, you know, culture and everything else that we still use, then there has to be something to be said about their mythology too, right? Yeah, absolutely. And what I love about the Greek stories is that these Sure, they're, you know, supernatural, they're um, gods, but they're super flawed and Mm -hmm. relatable, and we can see ourselves in them. But at the same time, they're eternal in their characteristics. So when you look at angry Ares or disfigured Hephaestus being with Aphrodite, power hungry Zeus, jealous Hera, like these are all like uh, characters that we see in people, in uh, movies, films, books. And they're just, they're just super great. What's the word I'm thinking about? Like the uh, prototypes. They're yes, great yep. prototypes for characters. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that too. And it's, um, and I, I've realized even more so when I started writing that series, how, how true that is, because as much as, you know, these mortals that I have them interacting with, they, the gods themselves kind of, you know, discover things about themselves and grow and change. And uh, so it, I, I didn't realize actually how much what you just said is true until I started writing and realizing the journeys that they can take, even just me pulling from the myths and, and making them modernize. So yeah, exact, exactly. And even the, the plots, so characters, plots, you have, um, just pulling some off the top of my head, the, like the pretty popular girl in school and the, the, the not so popular, maybe disfigured boy, you know, in school getting together. Or let's see, what other ones did I write down? I write things down and then I have to remember to look for them. Um, I don't know, name it. What's another, uh, what's, okay, what is a Greek myth that Real, that you really love that's persevered and then we could talk about how we could translate it that into like a modern day movie um <clears throat> i mean i really i you kind of already um brought it up with the uh the, the the disfigured boy and the um the the popular girl or what have you um and that's one that i i haven't actually delved into myself yet but i i think that even just that itself could be easily retold in so many different ways um, or even just the grumpy meets sunshine, um, the yeah. Hades Persephone. Um, <laughs> yes. Per- yeah. Oh, there's so many interpretations. People love that. Yep. Yes. It's the tr- idea they're that, tropes. That- Exactly. Exactly. Yep. The idea that, you know, I'm rebelling against my mother's wishes. I'm going to go with this bad boy over here. Exactly. Uh- exactly. There are tropes all over the place in Greek myth, which made it, which makes them to me is why there's so many Greek myth retellings is mm-hmm. because they're easily translated. Now I'm going to say easy in the sense that, you know, obviously you have to sit down and write it, but th- they're just easy to translate into modern stories because of the fact that tropes are already sitting there that we mm-hmm. know and recognize. Absolutely. Okay. So then my next question kind of, re- I kind of, revi- I, ugh, excuse me, I kind of visited it already, but do you have a Greek myth that you love that just really sunk its teeth into you and hasn't let go? Uh, you know, it's hard to think of specific myths because I, I've gotten so wrapped up in the, the gods themselves and almost doing psych evals on all of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will tell you though, I, one that I've sunk my teeth into because I've had to really dig really deep and it's, it can be a little controversial because some people love it and some people with, but the Hades Persephone story, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, when I was younger, I was just kind of swept up in the idea of it and, you know, and I loved it and I still love it. But at the, also at the same time, I, you know, there's so many different avenues you can take with it. And it's, you know, yes, to me, there is a little bit of Stockholm syndrome there. If you are truly believing in the side of the myth where he, you know, plots to kidnap her essentially and take her down to the underworld and eventually she'll love me. Um, you know, there's that side of it. Then there's some that say that, you know, she, you know, yeah, she went down there and she had the choice of, of staying or not. And then, but then she ate the fruit, even though he warned her and then mm-hmm. she stuck there. Um, so there's so many different avenues, but I guess I've never been a huge fan of the Stockholm syndrome one. And this is why, because Hades himself is, you know, he deserves to be loved, um, and not necessarily to the point where she eventually just decided to be, to love him. Um, and, and then because, you know, what else really is there for her? (laughs) She's got, she's got this whole, you know, she can go up in the spring and then she has to come back down on the winter deal. But I mean, you know, 
to me, it's, it is, it's like, what else, what other option is there? I mean, and this guy's really sweet. He's making, you know, creates, he created the Elysian fields for her, all these different things. And so I just sometimes felt, you know, it's kind of a, you know, I think that he deserved to have his own love story where this woman actually loves him for him and from the very beginning and not because of any outside interference whatsoever, um, which is why some people love my Hades version and some hate it. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. But, but that's the route that I decided to take where this woman is not Persephone. It's Stephanie who is um, Persephone has left Hades and it's an ex exploration of what if somebody actually loved him from the very beginning because Ooh, she decided to. Yeah. I love yeah. that. And yeah. I think when it comes to readers too, you know, they bring their own content, context and history and experiences. And yeah. um, so that, that would definitely explain why some people love and, and don't love a concept. But yep. I remember watching in, you know, I think Hercules Legendary Journeys touched on the Persephone story and um, basically what happened, I think uh, going off of like 10 plus years of memory here, um, you have Persephone who gets taken away from her mother Demeter by Hades down to the underworld. And as she's Persephone's down there, um, she starts to see this softer side to Hades and yeah. actually wants to be with him. So she eats the food that's down there, and which which then eternally seals her with him for the half of the year that is winter. Um, I just thought that was so touching. Yeah, and it's and like I said, it, it is, it is. And I and I I think the other reason why I decided to to take a different route and to try to you know okay, well this one's been done and done and done and done, and so I said you know I'll I'll be different. I'm gonna try mm -hmm. something else. So and I uh, again I uh, Hades is super popular. I also did not realize how actually popular he is until I wrote and put that book out there <laughs> okay. i i honestly i don't know why i didn't know but i just didn't realize i guess how big of a pool he actually has mm. um and i honestly even with disney's hercules um because i also even wrote a fan fiction with uh megara ending up with hades instead of hercules <laughs> and nice. um, um i did it very <laughs> gotta, recently gotta love that <laughs> yeah all my readers actually when i after i released hades they they begged me to write i was like because i come from a fan fiction background originally before i ever wrote uh full-length novels with my own stuff um so i said you know what i haven't written i haven't written a fan fiction in a really long time and it was super fun um just to you know i i his that hades is the hades from uh disney not my version it's just completely different and um that actually if you think about it even though they didn't go full-blown because she ends up with hercules but at the beginning that was kind of a hades persephone deal yeah. um so i i kind of continued that instead of her ending up with hercules it is i made it into hades and persephone but with megara interesting so, i love yeah. that okay um my myth that has that i think about a lot i think because of its tragedy is the orpheus and eurydice uh, oh, story yeah. so this is the one where orpheus and eurydice get married and Eurydice gets bit by a snake and dies on their wedding night. Devastating, right? So she's yeah. down in the underworld and Orpheus is allowed passage to the underworld to get her back. He makes a deal with Hades and Hades allows Orpheus to take her back up to the surface as long as he walks ahead of her and does not look back at her. And I'm not sure if it varies depending on who's telling the story, but they, he essentially makes it out, turns to look at her before she's crossed the doorway and because she's still on the other side, she fades away. It's done. They're forever separated. And I'm just like, oh, God, that felt like one of those purposely stick the knife in you and twist it stories where it's yeah. like, oh, oh, so much hope until the very end. And then it's like, what's the point? Like, hope is dead. <laughs> yeah, I actually I, I somehow completely forgot about that myth until you just brought it up. As soon as you said the name Orpheus, like, oh, this is when she's going to talk about. It. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, that's sad. That is it so is sad. sad. Well, and I think what's interesting about Greek mythology is that it doesn't shy away from any particular type of narrative, right? It has yeah. joyful, sad, uh, triggering, um, messed up, but adventurous. And I think that's what makes it so great for storytellers and, and readers. Okay, so um, if you had to identify the major themes in Greek mythology that carry over into modern retellings, what would those themes be? Uh, I think redemption is a huge one. I've um, seen that in, through many, many myths and kind of obviously really played into that with uh, my modern retellings. I think um, even opposites attract is a huge one. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there is a lot of, of, of tropes. Um, geez, I'm trying to even think of some of the 
um, second chances. Um, yeah, that we talked about grumpy and sunshine and the, um, yeah, I'm trying to even think, um, I had this in my head and now I'm completely losing it. No worries. I have, I, while you're thinking, I have a contribution. Yeah. Um, I went more into the writing technical side. Um, I wanted to talk about the hero's journey, which is the classic. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you think about any of the heroes, like Hercules and I think Perseus and I'm forgetting now um, yeah. some of the other ones. Uh, that's I'm sure many writers know about the hero, hero's journey. But for those that don't and for those that are not writers listening in, we have... Um, the beginning of the story is the ordinary world and then the person the main character gets called to adventure which they reject but then something pulls them into the situation they meet with a mentor they have to cross the threshold from who they were before to this new adventure this new adventure person of, of them they're this new um, evolved form they go and overcome trials uh, they have to overcome supreme ordeals. They get rewarded for, you know, reaching their goal. Then they end up going in the road back. And sometimes there's some resurrection in there. The idea that um, you, you, you aren't your true hero self unless you die. I think a good example of this is the Matrix. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he dies, comes back, and now he's ready. And then, you know, return to the, the normal world where we were at the beginning, except things are a little bit better, hopefully. So... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great one. I I mean, I think it's for me because I am a romance writer, essentially, um, even though I've written things that are not straight romance um, that have a romance subplot. But I anything I write even has at least a romance subplot going on. Mm -hmm. um, And it's just something that I found that I just uh, I'm I'm it's easier for me to navigate just as a writer. It's just my niche. And so I think for me, because that that was a great one bringing up the hero thing. I hadn't even really thought about that. I see my my brain is automatically hardwired <laughs> to uh, to really when I'm reading any of these myths I it's automatically going into what can I what romance tropes can I pull out of this to, oh, okay to pull so, into <laughs> so then tell me about the romance side of the house like what are what are their tropes and structures so yeah so one thing that is really apparent is there's a lot I've noticed in these myths of proving your true love and, and even one that you you brought about Orpheus that is um, tragically um, he wanted to look at her because you know he you know she had been dead and now she's you know up on the surface with him and of course she's gonna want to he's gonna want to look at her so that's tragic uh, example of love but one thing that also comes up in my brain is the Eros story now some people believe in the side of Eros that is a primordial but if you go with the storyline of that's Aphrodite's son um, then you have to think about Psyche and I me myself I did the exact kind of myth of the whole deal where uh, Psyche um, she Aphrodite's jealous of her this is very all stuff that can actually happen jealous mom of her only son of this Mm -hmm. woman (laughs) Um, and she is also extremely beautiful. She's immortal. She's not even a goddess. And people are ignoring Aphrodite because of this beautiful mortal woman. So she gets even jealous more because of that. And then she, you know, her, her dad is praying to Aphrodite so that she, her his daughter can have a suitor, and they, she, she can't seem to find one who actually wants to marry her. They just are they just like her because of her beauty type deal. And Aphrodite hears his prayers, but decides to be all conniving about it and it gets Eros involved and he doesn't expect to fall in love with her. And so her whole plan goes awry, even when, you know, he tells Psyche, you know, you're not to look at me. You can't ever look at me. And of course she does. And it's just all this, you, to prove your true love, then Aphrodite is all you have to do these trials. You mentioned trials. So this mm-hmm. is the opposite of a hero doing trials to save what have you. But this is a woman who's put through trials or a man to prove their their love for the other. And they'll go, you know, through hell and high water to to prove it. And that was one thing that I noticed. Um, it, it happens quite often. I can't think of another one right off the top of my head, but that is at least there's at least three instances where I saw, and they may have not been as extravagant as what Aphrodite tried to put Psyche through, mm-hmm. um, but they're they're definitely there. It's constantly. Um, And I also, I kind of explored, well, why do they have to prove their love in such a way? Why can't it be through, um, you know, even unspoken word, subtle little things that somebody does can be a proof of love without them ever even having to say it. Um, So, I mean, with Eros, I, I, 
did it actually where she, you know, she couldn't even say the words and it was a big huge thing for her and then in Zeus though it's completely different because he he doesn't even know or realize that he knows how to love because his entire you know life has just been about um it has been about sexual conquest and all you know just you know he he likes women i mean i, I don't i don't negate that fact zeus is zeus and he will always be synonymous with liking women um but that there's a different discovery there about um how to love and and how you know that that that's a continuous you know uh theme too i find is how to love um, and even maybe not another person, but yourself. And that's something that I find a lot in those myths too. So as a romance writer, when you're looking at the plethora of Greek mythologies to kind of get inspired by, there's a dark side of love. And we've touched on this before. I'm going to touch, I'm going to specifically talk about Apollo and Daphne, that myth. This is the one where Apollo is the sun god and he falls in love with Daphne, this beautiful nymph. I believe it might've been a circumstance where, Cupid shot him with an arrow when he saw Daphne and at the same time she she was also shot with an arrow that would make her always be repelled by him. I think it was one of those circumstances. And so as Apollo is endlessly pursuing Daphne and um, she's running away from him, she finally asks for help from her father who is the river god and right when Apollo catches her, she gets transformed into a tree. And um, even then, Apollo still loves her as a tree. And when he, I think one of the more chilling uh, aspects that come out of the story is when he embraces her and because she's a tree um, this is what the quote says it's, it, my bride he said since you can never be at least sweet laurel you shall be my tree my lure my locks my quiver you shall wreathe and upon hearing his words Daphne bends her branches unable to stop it so when you when you have like really interesting chilling scenes like that from the romance writer's perspective how what is your biggest challenge uh translating things that might be otherwise ugly to uh, be better received or, or to give it a better narrative. So really funny that you brought up that because I, I, my Apollo book, um, huge, huge a um, aspect, that entire myth you just described. And it, okay. com it comes up in Eros too, because obviously it involves both of them. And um, Eros and Apollo in my series just really don't like each other. <laughs> um, and it, it really did, uh, it, it spawned from, you know, an archery rivalry and then it, the him, Eros doing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I try... I, I try to make light of it in, again, it, and I get to have some creative license. Um, and yes, I do that. That entire situation happens in my series where yes, he gets, he falls in love with her and eventually keeps falling. It keeps in love with a tree, but I have it in my series and this may be a cop out, but it is what it is. Okay. <laughs> I have Eros eventually, but this is, we're talking hundreds of years later. So he is being tortured by this. And this poor Daphne is also, you know, still stuck as a tree. Um, he lifts the curse. Eros eventually does lift the curse because the thing is, though, Eros even starts out too. He's this arrogant little brat, and mm -hmm. he does start like that. A lot of these gods start arrogant, but because they, if if let's just say if they're real, they've been around for thousands of years. You cannot tell me that at some point in time they would have started to grow and change too, regardless of them being you know deities or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is what I had that he still does, despises Apollo, but he feels bad for Daphne, and so he lifts the curse so that she can you know be whole again. But in turn, he has to lift the curse on Apollo too. But he does do it because he he changes he grows and he realizes that okay that might have been a little bit extreme um so that's how i kind of try to and again i had mentioned earlier poseidon and medusa in those in the actual myth i mean he basically rapes her um mm -hmm. and i you know didn't want to include that um in my my stories it's just i i really try to keep the tra the super tragic stuff there's still some tragic stuff because that's life but i try to keep the really 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 dark stuff because i i don't write dark romances i write you know feel good romances um, and so I, you know, decided to, I, I can't really say exactly what I did on air here, but um, because it's be a spoiler. Um, but I did, 
find a way to work around and not only give Poseidon some redemption in the whole situation, I also put some um, Athena giving her some because she's the one who put, did the curse in the first place. And it was a little, you know, arrogant on her part of why she did it because it happened in her temple and she was kind of, you know, hurt about it. So I give her, she, she has to take some, some, you know, um, responsibility in there too. And I do give her that. And then also though, Medusa is also going to get some redemption um, in my story too, because I feel like uh, she does not get killed um, by Theseus. Was it um, Theseus? Perseus. I can't remember what Isis was to kill her right now. But... <laughs> I'm the same way. <laughs> <laughs> One of those us's killed her. Um, but I I took it out that actually Poseidon is the one who, who heard um, it being talked about on Olympus that it was going to happen. And he made a deal with the, the hero um, to, I've, it had something to do with a king and he was going to take care of it so that he wouldn't actually go and kill Medusa. So I actually switched it around where Poseidon saved Medusa's life and she didn't know it. So um, yeah, I, this is just different ways that I, you know, I, I really make sure that I know the original myth and then I look at the big picture and go, okay, how can I keep with the myth, but make it to the point where it's not as tragic as what may have actually happened in myth. So. Gotcha. Okay. So then as writers, we think a lot about our audience, how our audience would receive something, um, especially for thinking about books that could be distributed to as many readers as possible. In your research for Greek mythology, were you able to pick up on anything that told you about what the audience was like back then and how the stories, the original Greek myths are a reflection on, on their needs? Yeah. And I feel so, and this is the truth of it. I mean, even in, when you read historically about Greece, they, they definitely were very, you know, free minded people. Um, they, you know, the, they had orgies and they had these big parties and, you know, it did involve, you know, sex and wine and partying and everything like that. Um, which I think actually, uh, uh, Dionysus is a, a, a representation of that as a whole. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I think each god definitely did represent something about their culture. And I think that you can definitely, um, it, 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 it kind of takes into play of researching history plus the myths um, to be able to see the connections there, which I haven't delved as much in the historical side of things. I mean, I do know quite a bit about um, Greek and Roman history, but um, I definitely see it reflected there, even in just the temples, um, which ones did they actually have, who had the most, who had the biggest, you know, the, that really comes into play there, even down to the fact of um, Amphitrite as um, Poseidon's queen. And I really kind of dig into that because a lot of people don't even remember her name, but yet there were areas of Greece that she was extremely um, revered and they really they worshiped her. And that was the, that was the, their particular God. And I, uh, Venus de Milo, that statue with the arms cut off. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually recently just found out something a few months ago that there is some theory that they don't think that it's Aphrodite at all, which also to begin with, it, since it was found in Greece, it was funny they called it Venus de Milo because as we know, that's the Roman name for her. Mm -hmm. um, so that right there was a little odd, but she was found near that, uh, the temple is gone now, but near that area where they worshiped Amphitrite. So my their theory is and i actually wonder if this is true is that that statue is actually her and not aphrodite um so there's like different things like that you can really um even just even today you know uh the, aphrodite was so popular they just automatically assumed that that had to be her and you know she's beautiful it has to be the goddess of love and um i think that 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 is kind of a, a say as to you know their culture too as far as you know what which god they worshipped and even like hades didn't or, or aries they were called cults if they worshipped Ares, not, you know, worshippers. And there weren't really many temples in his honor, nor Hades, um, because I think they feared Hades, obviously, because of what oh, he was. Okay. Um, but that's the thing, too. And also, um, us as a culture kind of you know, giving Hades this, he's the death of everything when there's an actual god of death who actually is the one, um, Thanatos, who actually, you know, takes the spirits. But then they also really focused on Hades, you know, fearing him when he's just kind of a divider of souls in my eyes. He's not really the one who, you know, takes you from the surface and brings you down. He's just the one you see when you get there. So, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Like correlation doesn't equal causation. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I think it even be played into other, you know, Lucifer and other, you know, gods of, you know, death or, you know, or hell or Tartarus or everyone to call them. Um, but it's, I think that's a constant theme there and they, uh, they had it too. So, <laughs> So when we look at Greek mythology, we're pulling from stories, we're pulling from statues, we're pulling from a lot of culture. So hypothetically, if we're thinking into the future several hundred years and people from the future are looking back at our American culture, what do you think that they're going to see as mythological from now? So a big thing that I, and I've actually been uh, toying this with my brain of, of kind of playing off it myself, but the idea of the American cowboy I think that's going to eventually be absolute, complete myth to the point where we, we were obviously a baby country. America is a baby country. And I, I kind of see cowboys as our answer to we needed some form of hero, um, idealizing them, making, you know, putting them on a pedestal to the point where they're, they're not just cattle ropers. They have become these, you know, icons of history, the old West and gunslingers and, um, heroes essentially. Um, and then you also have the bad guys to the cowboys who, you know, and yeah, there was some, you know, historical aspects, but when you really dig deep into it, they're almost, you know, how, um, Europe put knights on this pedestal too. They've kind of been glorified. Um, I think that cowboys are our, ver are, are our version of knights. And eventually I think they're just going to be complete myth because a lot of the things you hear about cowboys and in the old west um, some of it is you know fictional and I think that over time the fictional has become um, intertwined with fact to the point where uh, sometimes I even have to look stuff up and uh, is this is this true did this actually ever happen you know um, so I think I think that that is actually going to be you know almost you know when we see uh, King Arthur the Knights of the Round Table you know are is there some fact there maybe but it, you know what is fact versus fiction in that whole story um i i think that that's eventually going to be cowboys for america as well interesting okay i went into a more let's see fictional world because I, I i um was trying to think like if someone dug up a i don't know a cd or, or a disc or something even though everything we do is cloud-based um i don't know so i don't know how easy that would be especially with the prevalence of streaming and you don't have to have your dvd collection anymore um but i was thinking marvel dc comics i think those are like an easy kind of you know uh assumption to make uh part of me wonders if today's influencers and and the lore behind influencer uh, will take off and kind of evolve into something, uh, especially because it's such a nebulous idea on what influencing means, but um, yet so numerous. That, that That's kind of just one thought I had. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, um, was it uh, Neil, Neil Gaiman, uh, as far as uh, the neon gods type concept? Mm, okay. Um, that was something too that... I was trying to think about how to even, you know, describe what I was thinking as far as technology being seen as um, obviously technology is going to just continue to skyrocket and we might have, you know, AI robots and all this stuff. However, we'll even talk way, way in the future. Let's just say hypothetically that um, we get back to a stone age period and we ever, all technology gets knocked out, um, you know, or, uh, um, apocalyptic type scenario that we get back to and then technology maybe was seen as how he kind of described it too you know as worshiping you know they become these you know these gods whereas it's technology so they're not necessarily but it could i could see how another culture from even another part of the galaxy might see that as you know oh these this species viewed what they may actually already have even in their you know arsenal they viewed it as almost they put it on this worshiping status you know they they had it with them constantly and they they mm, the they cell really, phone yeah and they uh -huh. they really just let it control their lives whereas maybe this other species is using it to you know enrich their lives versus controlling them so that's what something i've always thought about too is them you know kind of us worshiping technology versus using it to our advantage and letting it control us so that makes me think, I was listening to another podcast, it, it, it's my guilty pleasure, it's called Fluently Forward, it's about a celebrity blind item gossip, but the thing that I found, found to be so interesting is the, the, the use of 
uh, they're, they're like army bots. And so let's say that you're a celebrity and someone puts out something negative about you. You can have bots, like basically other mm-hmm. social media accounts, start flooding things on your behalf with saying whatever they need to say to support you. And depending on the algorithms, depending on the quantity, now another person who just comes across this news item and reads something probably bad about you, they read the comments and they see a lot of people say, that's not true, that, that can't be true, this person's great. And it's all these hired bots, it's not real people. And how that shapes your perception of people and how not only is it something that's being done to you, but you could, if you were rich enough, I guess, by that service. And when you talk about being controlled or being influenced by technology, how um, what's happening right now? So when I learned about that, I was like, yeah. oh, gosh, don't trust anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was um, I forget what the name of that documentary was recently on um, Netflix, the social something. But they they go into that really, really heavy. And it is very a bit scary about how um, you're unknowingly being really influenced in it. And it's, I think we're all at fault and it's just, it's, it's almost impossible because it is everywhere. Um, and as we just said, cell phones, we all have them. We all have the apps. We all have, you know, you know, some form of social media connection and um, it's definitely um, it's yeah, it's there. So it's just a matter of, again, it's trying to not let it control you as much as you possibly can. But also at the end of the day, it's how how do you even know when that's happening? You know? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I have some writing questions for you. Okay. What is the most difficult type of character to write? Oh, well, um, it took me a long time uh, trying to write from a male perspective. Um, Okay very difficult. Um, I, and I avoided it for a long time until recently. (laughs) Um, I basically, um, Zeus is my first full dual POV, uh, book. And I, I, a lot of people kept asking me and asking me, and I just, I, I was hesitant because I, I've read some really well done, uh, points of view, from the opposite gender. I mean, a guy, you know, doing a female point of view or vice versa. And I've read some really bad ones. Um, So I I really didn't want to be on the, you know, the latter end of that. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be done well. So I decided to wait. And then I, I realized that I knew the voice of Zeus pretty well. And so I wrote one chapter and I had some people read it. I even had my husband read it, which he, and I have no fault to him. He doesn't read my, my stuff really because it's romance and he's just not into it and that's fine. Um, but I did have him read it because I just needed him to tell me, does this sound even plausibly like it could be from a guy's brain? Um, and that is really difficult for me because you can either push it too far or you can make it completely unrealistic. Now it's a romance book. So yes, there's a bit of a fantasy in there. Um, so there, there may not be a hundred percent situations where, Oh, a guy would never say or do that. Well, it's a romance. So in my brain, he is this time. Um, but, uh, I really do want, I wanted to keep it as, as close as I could while also giving that license. And so that has been the most difficult for me. And even then I have to, you know, step out of using those same words that I would use or the heroine would use because it's not the same person. And it's really hard to step out of what you normally would think as a female um, to be able to situate it into a male, like how are they perceiving the situation? And it's, uh, it's difficult. I think that's the, definitely the most challenge for me. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. I appreciate yeah. that. Absolutely. And then for listeners wanting to write a Greek myth retelling, what is your main advice? Research, research, research. I can't stress that enough um, because you're going to have some people reading your your retellings that are green to Greek mythology and just coming in for the fun of it and they want to learn more about it. And then you're going to have ones that are very versed in the myths. And even if you're taking some license on it, which most of the people, if they read these, they realize that they are still going to be, you know, looking to see, does this person um, are they just maybe doing the retellings because they see the popularity or are they actually invested in, you know, making sure that they know where these myths are coming from? And, and, and you can tell, you know, and, and the people that are familiar with it can tell. Um, so definitely make sure that you have your research. Um, you know, if you're trying to go with what, like do the Greek spelling of the, of the gods, make sure you stick with it and know what they are. 
um, and just really make sure that you know your background on these characters, even if you plan on changing them so that you know um, even where they're coming from as you're going through the retellings. So that way new people can learn and uh, versed people can say, yep, she knows what she's talking about. Awesome. Well, Carly, thank you for being on the podcast. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with or to promote before you go? Um, I, again, Zeus is going to be coming out April 25th. Uh, there is, it's on pre-order right now and there is an incentive with a free art print and bookmark. If you show proof of pre-order, the link for that, you can find that on any of my social media pages, um, easily enough. Um, but really looking forward to it. And I hope that I can convince people that Zeus is not as bad as you think he is. And he's actually a pretty sexy God King. Speculative Sandbox is a volunteer-run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you. Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.